so far we saw data in the form of text we saw data in the form of images and we learned both discriminative models and generative models for both of them now let's go ahead and see a new type of data speech and music and try to do discriminative analyses and generative process using such data but what is the data like when you're dealing with the speech how are you going to represent your data so everything in deep learning starts with the data you are going to hear these words a lot mel spectrogram log mel spectrogram and mel frequency sepstral coefficients when you are doing machine learning uh, and deep learning in general and i think it's a good idea to see them and how you actually go ahead and construct them if you have a file if you have a sound file which could be either music or speech they're going to be in the form of .wav or any other form and let's say you have a soundtrack that is around three and a half seconds this is the raw wave form and now we want to turn that into mele spectrogram and mfccs the first step is doing fourier transform but if you do fourier transform on this signal you're just going to change the time to be frequency and you're going to get uh, the magnitude of your frequencies basically you're expanding your signal in terms of sines and cosines you're going to get some complex values but then you're going to take the absolute value of your complex fourier coefficients and that's going to give you some magnitude so it didn't help us we want to keep both the time and the frequency we want to keep both of them how are we going to do it you're going to use short time fourier transform stft what is the signal in the time domain you can think of it as a long vector where is this number coming from it is coming from let's say your speech is 3.5 seconds around that many seconds and your sampling rate or the number of samples per second is 8000 you are using 8000 uh, samples to represent your signal per each second so in total you are going to get 28200 dimension for your x for this signal uh, don't worry about this being doing function i'm going to go back to it but visually speaking what are what are we doing we have a signal in time this is the same signal as above you have a signal in time we are going to create windows we are going to look at windows this is the first window this is the second window the third window up until the last window so first you need to tell me what is your window size so we are going to make those more specific later on when we write the math and at the same time your windows are going to be overlapped so there is some overlap between the two let's say you're in this window you take this uh, signal and you want to take the fourier transform of that because this is a discrete signal you are going to use fast fourier transform but there is a problem with fourier transform and the type of signals that it can work with the signals need to go to zero that's why you're going to multiply them by this uh, windowing function that's a hamming function the hamming function is coming from cosine this could come from exponential so you can have different types of sliding window functions but here it's the hamming function it's the cosine and then you're going to do fast fourier transform this is a short signal you're going to do a fast fourier transform on that you're going to keep the time and this is going to be in terms of your frequency so the other axis is going to be frequency this is time that is frequency then you're going to have another one here until the last guy but mathematically what are you doing and why are you doing this let's take the ith frame let's say let's take the second frame and let's say the window that you're choosing is 25 milliseconds this is going to be 0 0.025 seconds you take that many seconds you multiply it by your sampling ratio and that's going to give you a vector that is 200 dimensional so each one of these windows are going to be 200 dimensional and then there is going to be some overlap or actually equivalently you can specify your frame step which could be 10 milliseconds so you're taking the step from here to here then there's going to be another step from here to there and these are 10 millisecond steps to give you the overlap and 10 milliseconds if you multiply it by 8000 
that's going to give you 80. So there is going to be 80 over, actually 80 is your step size. In the end, what did we do? The entire uh, signal, we can represent it as a matrix. It has 200 dimensions because this is where you're getting the 200 and you have 350 of them. So you have 350 of these time steps or frames. So you have 350 frames and each one is 200 dimensional. Where are we getting this 350 from? Uh, this is coming out of your step size. You can think of this as your stride. So you're striding by 80. And then because the last guy is gonna be 200 anyways, you're gonna subtract that from your entire, the, the size of your entire signal. And then you're gonna divide by 80 because you are taking step sizes of 80. That's where you are getting 350 from. Okay, perfect. Now you're gonna do the Fourier transform or the discrete Fourier transform of each one of these XIs, each one of these windows. We know that the Fourier transform is gonna take you from real numbers to complex numbers. And let's say you are keeping K Fourier coefficients. What are you gonna get in the end? You're gonna get a matrix that is complex valued and it has size K by 350. What is the Fourier transform? The discrete Fourier transform, this is the formula, and there is a fast algorithm for computing it. And this is complex valued because of this complex number. And then you are keeping K of them. And what is N? What are you summing over? Your N is gonna be the size of your signal per each frame. And that's gonna be 200. And these are independent. You do Fourier transform here, another one here, up until the last guy. And let's say you are keeping 257 for your discrete Fourier transform coefficients. These are the number of coefficients. Then we don't like working with complex numbers. You are gonna take the absolute value of a complex number. That's gonna give you a real number. You square it, divide it by the total number of samples per each frame of your signal. And that's gonna give you something that is called periodogram estimate for your power spectrum. And P is now in R257 by 350 because K was 257 and you have 350 frames. So far, so good. Now, these are in terms of frequency. These numbers that you have, they are gonna be in terms of frequency and frequency is something mathematical. We would like to work with something that has a, these are in terms of Hertz. We want to work with something that has uh, a meaning or a scale that is relative to how the human ear operates. That's why we are gonna change the scale and we are gonna go to Mele scale. But what is that? Let's choose a lower frequency. This is the lower bound. This could be zero, this could be 300 Hertz. Let's choose an upper frequency. This could be 4,000 Hertz or 4,000 is coming from dividing 8,000 by two. Because for those of you who know Fourier transform, you know that after you do the absolute value, you're gonna get some symmetries around your axis and then you can divide your frequency by two. You can just get rid of the rest of it because it is just a duplicate. So 4,000 is coming from 8,000 divided by two. Now you want to convert frequency in terms of Hertz to Mele scale. This is the formula for it. You can think of it as going from centigrade to Fahrenheit. Some people are more comfortable with centigrade. Some people are more comfortable with Fahrenheit. Okay, but to human ear, the Mele scale is the one that we understand. So our human ear works in terms of Mele scale. And as you can see, there's a log here. So you're taking a log of your Hertz. And then you can go backward by taking exponential. You can convert from Mele scale to Hertz. But why are we doing this? Because now you can take your Hertz. You can go to the Mele scale. You can take the upper bound, you go to Mele scale, and then here you can operate linearly. You can do a linear lean space between this lower bound and that upper bound. And let's say you want to create 26 filter banks. So 26 is the number of filter filters that we're gonna use. And they're gonna be triangular. What did we just do? We created this figure, things are gonna be linear, See here, you, you, it appears that these are nonlinear because you're taking the inverse and going back to Hertz. But in the Mel scale, things are linear. The distance between this point and the other point are linear. 
It's the same as a distance from here to here and so on. You can put this in a matrix. You have 26 triangles. This is one, two, three, and if you count it, the ones that are above 300, there should be 26 of them. So you have 26 triangles. These are the rows of your matrix and the columns are most of the times zero. And then suddenly they are non-zero. They go up until one and they, they come back and they, they become zero. So this is a sparse matrix. And you might say you should have 4,000 numbers there. Why do you have 257? Because you are just reading off your frequencies from here. K goes from one up until 257. And those are the ones that you're gonna read off from these triangles. You don't read all of these numbers on your triangle. You just read some of them and put that in that matrix. Why are you doing that? Because now you can multiply P, which was your power spectrum by T, and that's gonna enable you to compute the total energy. So EIL is gonna be the amount of energy in filter bank L at time frame I. So the time frame we are keeping, I is gonna be 350. It's the energy because you are doing a summation. Whenever you're doing matrix multiplication, there is gonna be a summation on 257 numbers. Most of them are zero. Some of them are non-zero. The ones that are non-zero are giving you the energy inside this triangle. And then you take a log. Some people take the log, some people don't take the log. But if you take the log, that's going to give you log mele spectrogram. And this is usually what your deep neural network is going to see. You can work with raw data or you can work with log mele spectrograms. If you don't take the log, that's going to be mele spectrogram. This is for deep learning. And if you're doing machine learning, like Gaussian mixture models and hidden Markov models, you're going to take another step pre-processing your data. You're going to compute MFCC coefficients. How? You're going to take a discrete cosine transform of the Mele spectrogram. And what is discrete cosine transform? It is like discrete Fourier transform, but you're getting rid of the signs. You're only keeping the cosines. So these are the coefficients in front of your cosines. Any questions? And if you want to play around with some code, there is this nice YouTube video that you can watch how to actually turn your signals into Mele spectrogram and MFCCs. Any questions? Was everything clear? I need to hear a couple of yeses. I think everything's clear for me. I guess, um, is there like a, an easy motivation for wanting to do this? Yes, so one motivation is working with vectors that are this huge, 28,200 is uh, not as good as idea as working with 350 sequences, a sequence that has 350 for its length. And the other motivation is these are gonna be scalars, these are gonna be vectors. And we know that deep learning likes vectors. And the other motivation is you're gonna read papers and they're gonna talk about male spectrogram and male frequency substral coefficient. And then uh, this is the starting point. If you don't know this, you're not going to be able to read that paper. Okay? Does yeah, that answer your question? Yep. Thank you. And the other thing is that uh, you are not losing much information here. After this process, you can just go back and forth between your wave and your Mele spectrogram because we know that Fourier transformation is efficient. Okay? So I, um, I feel I understand the Mel spectrogram, but uh, for the Mel frequency, Sexual coefficients is the only difference I replace my uh, DFT with a DCT and do the exact same thing? No, no, no. You, you still follow all of these steps. You do STFT and then you create your filter banks. Then you compute your Mele spectrogram. You need to make sure that you're taking a log. So it needs to be log Mele spectrogram. And then you do another Fourier transform. It's not actually Fourier transform. It's discrete cosine transform to give you these coefficients. So you do it on this. Okay, so you do the, okay, that makes sense. It's just one extra step. Okay, thanks. And uh, yes, and some of you might wonder, is this an English word or no? It is actually, uh, you can read sepstral as the inverse of spectral because now you're doing another Fourier transform here and that is spectral, okay? 
So sepstral can divide it into two and say this is spectral. And this is how scientists name this. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Sure. I think, um, is it possible to go back from, say, male spec or the uh, SEP store back to the regular audio? Do we just reverse yes. the steps? So you can, you can go back and forth. This step, it's going to lose some information, but you can go back and forth between raw audio and male spectrogram. So you are not losing much information. The only assumption that you're making is that in this short period, of 25 milliseconds, your wave is stationary. And it's a good assumption for a speech. And actually hidden Markov models are based on that, that in the short interval, things are gonna be stationary. So yes, you can go back and forth between the two. You're not losing information. Any other questions? So it's a different representation of the same data, which is convenient for deep learning. So this is really convenient for deep learning. Most of the papers that you're going to read are going to use male spectrogram, and some of them recently are using raw audio, and we're going to see examples.